Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our panel session. So, I'm just going to start with a few words to set the scene for the panel discussion. So, I've got a few slides here. Being an academic, I have to have my PowerPoint deck. So, we are looking at new technologies. We're looking at ethics and regulations, so um, really building upon the last two sessions. And um, look, some of this I might go over because we actually have covered some of this um, in Nerida's presentation before and Luke's presentation in the last session. So I guess we, we know there's, there's a lot of new technology and um, platforms out there. Um, we have online application platforms. Um, we were talking before, um, Lance was talking about um, really reducing that regulatory environment, breaking down the time it takes um, for people to take back volumes of documentation to fill out. And look, breaking down that regulation is, is, is a really significant barrier. I think in Australia, um, that whole regulatory environment across all sectors um, is valued at over $250 billion of loss of productivity. So it's a huge figure when we're looking at regulation and how we might um, realise some efficiencies. Um, there's, there's sites out there, and uh, I think um, Nerida had um, an array of sites out there, um, which probably encompass some of these, um, the inspect um, real estate and open for inspection sites. So there's, there's a myriad of these sites out there now. In fact, that is one of the challenges, is there actually is a myriad of these sites. And um, I was at the Smart Cities World Expo last year, there was 18,000 participants, and we start looking at apps, um, whether you're looking at fintech or whatever sector, there's just like hundreds and hundreds of apps being developed regularly. So how do you, you know, we, well, we, we all got the Uhuri app, um, but, you know, there's, there's another, you know, probably 100 or 1,000 apps for, for housing in Australia today. So um, we've also um, touched upon already the alternative um, bond products, and there's some work um, being published um, um, with Kath Hull and Chris Martin and others looking at um, bond products, and there's another Uhuri report there. But you've got um, sites like Trust Bond, and they have something called a Trust Score. And this is, to me, starts to get to some of the issues around transparency. And what is that Trust Score? Now, I tried to do some digging in. We've looked into those sorts of metrics. And it's a little bit like artificial intelligence. You actually can't work out exactly how it's calculated. And I guess that... that that, I guess, is, is, is possibly partially the fact that it's, um, there's the IP behind the algorithm that needs to be respected because it has commercial value. But it also then you wonder, how is this trust score created? Can you trust the trust score? Um, and it opens up these myriad of ethical and regulatory issues that we need to really start to unpack further. And we know there's um, social media, and it, it gives us a social rating, just like they have in China now um, for citizens. Everyone has a social rating. So they've taken the whole social media to the next um, level. And there's other sites out there. And, um, yeah, I think um, my housing and Lance has really gone into the details there. So in our report, we, we sort of highlight what's happening in New South Wales. And in Queensland, too, they have their Housing Assist app. And so we're starting to see um, some of this new technology being picked up by departments around the country, which is um, very promising to see. OK, but... For me, a lot of these apps and these platforms are pretty much, well, say it, useless if we don't have reasonable data in there. And the better the data that we've got in there, the better the, the utility of these platforms. And so really, there's been discussions at a federal government level um, through the Department of Innovation about really valuing data as an actual asset, as infrastructure. Um, this building is infrastructure but the thinking that data can actually be infrastructure, and hence this led to the funding of Orin under the infrastructure program, where they've received about $30 million over the last um, seven or so years as an infrastructure project. And so the Productivity Commission 2017 also is talking about um, data on housing commencement and the various housing activities, um, housing affordability, social housing, and so forth and accessibility to be picked up as a national interest data set. So there's various foundation data sets that we have in Australia. Obviously, the census from ABS. Um, there's about 10 spatial um, national um, data sets in the national framework where we've got geocoding and those sorts of things. Um, but really, um, the Productivity Commission highlighted that, that data as an asset is something that really should be um, considered. 
um, with a lot of um, seriousness. Now, data terminology, usually I give a whole, um, a whole course or a whole masterclass on, uh, on data. We just ran one at the Smart Cities conference a, a few weeks ago. But just to give you a flavour and leave you the slide deck, you know, we've got a lot of data types out there. And I just come back to the point, even understanding how do we have a conversation around the ethics of data and technology and platforms if we don't know what we're talking about. And so, and it's a changing landscape. So, um, you know, we've got spatial data or location data. It's been around for a while and 80% of our data is spatial. You know, we, we know maps, we know geography. That's good. Big data sort of came on the scene, you know, um, 20 years um, or less. And it's really started to pick up. Now, you know, we need more than just our Excel spreadsheets. And we have open data, um, which has really been around for probably 10 years. And in Australia, we're not too bad on the open data barometer. We're in the top five in the world as a country. And that's because we have a national policy around open data. We have state government policies. But how many actual open data platforms do we have? And then there's degrees of openness. Is it completely open? Is it free? Um, is it subscription? Um, in Singapore, they consider open data um, if another department can access that data. So when I go into a conference with colleagues from Singapore and they're talking about open data, that just means someone in the next department can access the data. It doesn't mean the community or non-for-profits or other people can access the data. So we've got this, this whole sort of nomenclature and understanding. And then we've got dark data, which isn't really that sinister. It's just data that we don't know about. It's untapped data. And then we have thick data where we start to add um, a lot of values. For example, if we take this geodesign approach, that little sketch there is people sketching qualitative information, their ideas of new housing developments. And they can capture that data and they can add that to locational data and they can create this thick data asset. So there's my whirlwind tour of data, some of the terminology. But platforms, there's the opportunity to set up a myriad of platforms and there isn't one platform to rule them all. They can all be interoperable and connected. And we really need to understand that. And so we had this ARC LEAF grant um, a couple of years ago. We've set up this open data platform. And I just highlight it as one example because as researchers, we don't do a great job either of releasing our data. We can put it in reports. And so there's some research we did with um, Professor Bill Randolph and others looking at housing intensification. So we've, we've done some research on that. But then the actual data sets in the factor analysis are actually available on the city data store. So if anyone else wanted to look at the housing intensification data and use it, they could talk to this authoritative data set that was created by the actual research team. And so trying to share those data sets and having these platforms set up, I know RMIT has one, but I think we have various state government agencies have those platforms, but I'd like to see a lot more of these platforms. But that does raise the whole ethics of, um, and the privacy concerns and brings those more to the forefront. We have big data, and so this is our toolkit here working with the private sector. This is with the domain group, and um, really we've got ability to drag and drop um, the combination of open data, closed data. Um, in this tool, you can rapidly put in new infrastructure, new train station. In a matter of a few minutes, it will calculate what the value uplift will be and the property prices around that train station. So you've now got the ability, if you open up data sets, you can have rapid analytics. Um, smart buildings, we're just installing this in our own building um, at the moment in the Red Centre at UNSW. It's air quality monitoring networks. Um, and so you have air quality sensors in rooms just like this. And it's not that hard to do. So if we're looking at um, housing across the board, putting in this air quality monitoring sensor network is, is something that's quite uh, readily deployable. But then you get other measures like occupancy. If you know CO2 in a room, you can deduce roughly how many people are in that room. And that actually brings in data um, privacy concerns and all sorts of things you have to be wary of. So you've got these secondary third uses of the data. And so smart buildings, um, also very important from the perspective of housing. So I really like this um, piece of work that we've written up in the report around the five safes framework developed by ABS. And it's really looking at uh, making sure we've got the right sort of framework around our data sets um, to be ethical. We have the right considerations when we look at any data set um, that we, we put people first. Um, you know, is, is the researcher the user of that data? Um, do they have the right permissions? Have they signed the right um, contracts and deed polls to access that? Um, is it project specific? Um, and you know, what, what are the settings around that data? Is it going to be secure? 
Um, is it cyber secure? Is it cyber ready? That cloud-based infrastructure with everything in the cloud raises all sorts of issues and opportunities. Um, safe data. Um, has there been the right protection placed on the data if we're looking at blockchain and those sorts of things? Um, and the output, are the results um, non-disclosive? So we haven't actually re released some results that can identify and compromise someone's privacy. So that framework's out there. I'm just going to conclude very quickly. We've got a lot of detail in our, in our um, paper around the role of government in the digital sector because it's not straightforward anymore. It's not government just as a consumer. It's also as a um, provider and also as a regulator. And just as an example, um, I was working with one council, I'm not going to name the council, who actually purchased the data asset um, of a 3D model of, that, of, of, the, of the built environment, the housings and so forth in their jurisdiction. Um, they actually purchased that model, but they don't own the model. And so as researchers, they couldn't give us a copy of the model. Even though they had paid for the data, they didn't own the data. And they didn't realise that until later on. So you've got this whole issue of smart procurement. And um, you, you, know, you think you've got the data, but do you really have the data? And that raises its own ethical um, concerns. And so th there's now that government is really um, in this digital economy, fair and square, purchasing services from an array of digital providers. We even have the big four now offering um, digital services. Um, we have all these companies, SMEs, startups, which is great. Um, but we really need to really dig down and understand what those ethical regulatory considerations are. So, concluding remarks. Um, we've obviously got the rise of um, digital innovation. Um, we've got data as an infrastructure. And I think if organisations, uh, obviously Narita's organisation has highly embraced this, um, data as an asset, as an infrastructure, um, I think government departments are doing this to various degrees, as are other businesses. Um, I think it changes the mindset. And um, we need, I think it's important in this conference too, is that data and technology, they're, they're not the same. Data powers the technology, it's the fuel for the technology, and they do both need consideration. And some um, councils and government organisations, even our university now has a chief data officer, not just the chief technology officer, because data warrants its own special consideration. So how do we embrace that from a regulatory, ethical and governance perspective I think is really important.